martial arts is much like a motorcycle trip. It's about the journey, it's not about the destination. Hello, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and this is episode 250. Today, our guest is Master Henry Childers. It's going to be a great episode. I want to thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the show, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and you can find everything that we do from this podcast to our products to all the other things that we create for your benefit at whistlekick.com. If you want to check out the other 249 episodes we've done, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or you can find them on YouTube, you can find them in iTunes, you can find them pretty much anywhere that you can subscribe to podcasts. I'm excited for our guest today because of his interesting character. Today's guest is Master Henry Childers. This man started martial arts because of problems in his family, but then he found a second home in the martial arts. Master Childers started training at 14 with his best friend, and he never stopped. Now, I could tell you a whole bunch more about him, but I'd rather let him tell you his story. So let's do that. Master Childers, welcome to Whistlekick Montreal It's Radio. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, thank you Appreciate for being here. Appreciate the opportunity here. to talk with you. Oh. Listeners, I should let you know that... that Master Childers and I, we've been talking for a few minutes now. We had a, a great conversation on the phone. What was that? A couple weeks ago. And I'm looking forward to this. We, we've had some good chats and, and I just have a, I have a good feeling about this. Not that I have a bad feeling about any of the other. Actually, that's not true. I have had a couple that I've had bad feelings about, but they turned out okay. <laughs> I have a great feeling about this one. Uh, would you like to expand on that bad feeling? You had Absolutely on? Oh, no. not. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. well, well, actually, a, a bit. We'll just say that there are some people who, when I start talking to them, give one and two word answers, which doesn't lend them lend things well to a podcast that has a typically hour longish format. You know, fear, yeah, I can imagine that might be difficult. Fear of having a three minute episode. All right. But I know that's not going to happen with us today. Sure. Let's go all the way back. <laughs> I caught what you did there. Don't worry. Let's go, okay. all the, let's go all the way back to whatever the beginning is. And why don't you tell us how you found martial arts? How I found martial arts? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I'm old, so you know, it's hard to go that far back. Let me see, 1964, I guess. Uh, I was 14 years old. I was living in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, there was no karate. The only thing in Louisville at that time was boxing, wrestling, of course, through school, and, uh, and judo. And quite frankly, I had a very uh, bad uh, home situation. Uh, kind of an abusive situation where my older brothers had already been run out of the house. And uh, as a, you know, 14 year old kid, I was, I was, I was scared, which I think is probably what gets a lot of people into the martial arts is something is happening to them or has happened to someone they know. And uh, they don't want to be put in that position. They want to feel like they have some power. They have some control over things. So really that's how I got started in the martial arts. I started at the downtown, uh, YMCA, I would uh, either hitchhike or bicycle. I was a great bicycler in those days from uh, out in the county to downtown Louisville twice a week and uh, take judo lessons. And I made a deal with my blood brother at the time that uh, if he would uh, sign up to take judo lessons with me, I would scuba dive with him. And years later, we did exactly that and, you know, Dove a lot of interesting places around the world. Besides uh, doing a bit of martial arts together, he's still uh, still my hero. So that's how I got started. How that continued was a lot of travels around the country, from New York to Los Angeles, Cincinnati, Ohio, to Florida, the Keys, and pretty much uh, everywhere I went, I just 
picked up what I could and uh, worked with whomever I could. And uh, it's been a real interesting journey. Martial arts is much like a motorcycle trip. It's about the journey. It's not about the destination. So the journey continues. This man that you called your blood brother, why did you want him to be the one you trained with? Well, you know, you you have a family, and, you know, your family's your family. That's your blood relatives, and they're assigned at birth, and they either are good or they're not, not good. And in my case, uh, we weren't an extremely close family by any means. I had I have really good brothers. I have uh, one of them just recently passed away. That's why I'm going to Louisville next week to have to take care of some family business. Uh, the other one passed away about four years ago. He was a uh, in the music business and a very interesting man and uh, has exhibits around the world and has a, has a cult following of his own. But we were markedly different individuals. Uh, you know, they were very intelligent, very talented in their own right, but uh, we, we really didn't have much in common. My, uh, my blood brother, who uh, lives up in Colorado, he was in a similar situation I was. He didn't have a uh, he didn't have a close knit family. We were kind of running the streets, and had uh, we not adopted one another, we probably would be uh, much different people, and probably not uh, in the good place that both of us are in now. Because uh, sometimes you need need people, and your friends, your contemporaries. Uh, those are the ones that you choose as family. And I've been very, very fortunate in my life to have uh, not a great number. I don't think anybody can say they have a great number of, uh, of really close, close friends. We have a lot of acquaintances. I have hundreds of acquaintances through the martial arts, uh, hundreds of, of people I really like and, uh, and enjoy working with and uh, enjoy sharing time with. Uh, but there are only, you know, generally in a lifetime, you can count on one hand the people that uh, you truly can uh, can call family and, you know, will be there regardless of uh, what happens. They're never judgmental and always uh, have your back. And uh, he and I, when we met, we were supposed to uh, get in a fight over a girl, to be exact, and uh, we ended up being great friends. So, uh, you know, he was my family by choice, and uh, we took care of each other. Yeah, that's why we trained together. Other than that, he was one really tough guy. <laughs> so if you're going to pick a training partner, pick a, pick somebody tough because you're not going to get any better unless you unless you work with people who are better than you and have a, have a better skill set, and better tools than you do. Would you have started judo without him? I don't know. I don't know, because by that time, uh, we were both, uh, you know, we had bonded pretty much as, as, as brothers. So would I have started without him? Yeah, probably. I would have probably started it without him, but I wouldn't have had near as much fun. I mean, the very first uh, time we tested for a belt in judo, we uh, we left a week before the testing was to come up. So rather than just uh, demonstrate your ukimi and and you know and so forth, we had to uh, split the class in half, and I had to compete with one half of the class. He competed with the other half of the class one at a time, not like a kung fu movie. But uh, since he was larger than me, he got the large half of the class. I got the small half of the class because I was the second smallest guy in the place. But uh, we had about six people each. And uh, we did real well. We had, we had a lot of fun. Uh, we got beat up pretty good, and, and there weren't, uh, in those days, there wasn't uh, violent covering on your mats. They were just rough canvas, so we looked like we had been dragged down a gravel road when we were done. We had so many, you know, skin marks and strawberries and so forth, and we went down and fell in a swimming pool in the basement of the YMCA, and the chlorine just about killed us. It was worse than the, uh, the competition had been. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good and, times. <laughs> and what's the most memorable place that the two of you went scuba diving? Uh, hmm. On a concrete ship off the Bahamas that had been used for uh, strafing 
during the war. And so the story goes, was the last place that the infamous torpedo bombers that disappeared into the Bermuda Triangle were reported to be. That would probably be one of the most interesting, eerie places to ever go, since it was concrete and sunken in the water and had all this rebar hanging down and looked a lot like out of a you know a horror film set. So but that was yeah, that was real interesting. That was good. And then we did a lot of freshwater uh, diving when we were younger. Did a lot of rock quarries. It's amazing how much life there is in rock quarries and things of that nature. Hmm. I'm not a scuba diver myself. I've I've done a little bit of snorkeling, but I we did some caves too. That's always fun. Okay, spelunking, diving in caves, and it is true. You can get up in it and not know if you're going up or down. So really, okay. Yeah, I always saw people lying to me till I was swimming along and looked and saw the bubbles were going in the wrong direction. <laughs> I went, hmm, maybe I'm backwards. Because <laughs> you have no point of reference. Right. Right. It is clear that you're a storyteller. And, you know, you've told me a number of stories off air. If I was to, to pin you down and say that the only way you could get up is to tell your favorite martial arts story, which one would you share? Well, my favorite martial arts story... Well, I can't do that because it's going to sound like I'm bragging. That's okay. And and I don't want to brag. And uh, so that means I have to change the names to protect the innocent and the guilty both. <laughs> uh, okay, I guess uh, one of my favorite martial arts stories. One of my favorite martial arts stories is how I got involved with the uh, Tracy Company. And that was in Louisville, Kentucky. I traveled uh, I traveled up to New York and dabbled in some Wing Chun up there and did some uh, training in, in Judo, further training in Judo up there. Uh, got involved in uh, in Taekwondo up there. Got, got to meet some of the notable people around the New York area. Uh, had a really good time, but then I had a uh, relative get sick back in Kentucky. And so I went back. I went back to Kentucky to, to help out. And when I got back there, there was no place to train. I mean, there were a lot of places to train. By this time, there were places to train. This was the early 70s now. But there were no places that, that I wanted to train. You, you know, you have to have a feeling about a place. You have to feel like you're, you know, you have to feel like you're, you know, it's going to serve the purpose you have. And what I was looking for at the time, because I was young, and uh, and because I had had a, uh, a relatively uh, interesting upbringing, uh, I wanted some place where the, where where the, the best competition there was. You know, where I was going to meet the toughest guys I could meet, and that means they had to be able to beat me and they had to be able to beat me hands down. So I, I did a, uh, you know, did a tour of all the, the karate studios in that area. And there were some nice people, some fine martial artists, uh, but it wasn't what I was looking for. And I went in the Tracy studio, which was on Barkstown road at that time and was a small school. And believe it or not, was one of the, <laughs> the, best schools at that time in that system. I mean, business wise, they were just, they were doing incredible business and it was a boom time. And I went in and I, I said, well, you know, you know, I was, I was smart. I like, and I went in and asked to work out the black belt. You know, I want to work out with one of your best black belts, blah, blah, blah. You know, like everybody else that does that, you know, went in and blew my horn. And I worked out with a young green belt, kind of a, uh, pretty blonde kid who I looked at and thought, I'm going to kill this guy. And uh, he just beat me something awful. Uh, and it was because, it wasn't because he was strong. It wasn't because he was particularly fast. It was because he had really, really good training. And comparatively speaking, my technical knowledge of just basics. And here again, it all comes back to basics. I mean, uh, my foundation compared to the foundation that uh, Jim Stewart was the owner of that school and still is my friend and my mentor today. And this is 50 some odd years later. Um, he was, he was just turning out the toughest guys. I mean, it was just amazing the quality of fighters he was turning out. And uh, there was nobody else in that area that could compare. 
Uh, it wasn't near as traditional as many of the schools. It didn't have the pomp and the circumstance. It was, uh, the keys were kind of threadbare and, uh, we were kind of sweaty and, you know, we worked real hard and, uh, and that, uh, really formed a brotherhood. And first time I ever worked out with Mr. Stewart was in a room that was about 10 feet by 10 feet was had wood paneling on the walls. And someone had told him that I was a black belt from another system, which was not true. I was a brown belt from another system at the time. And, uh, and that I had come down there expressly to kind of, you know, get what I could and then run back to where I, I had come from. In other words, I was a industrial spy. So we went in the back room and we worked out together in this little 10 foot by 10 foot room. And he broke every piece of wood paneling on that wall with my body. However, that being said, he did it in a very nice way. He didn't hurt me. He just launched me through the wall every t- every chance there, you know, that he got, which was numerous. And uh, after about an hour, uh, I was smart enough to keep my elbows down, you know, and keep my chin tucked. But uh, after about an hour, you know, I, I finally got a shot in. I think he actually let me get it in. And uh, he bowed to me and he said, hey, good job. I'll see you next week. And walked out of the room. And I thought... I just I knew right then that had he wanted to injure me, had he wanted to hurt me, he could have done it any time he wanted to. All he wanted to do was establish his dominance and show me who was boss. And he certainly showed me who was boss, and he certainly established his dominance. And the next week when I showed up for my session with him, the first thing he said was, I didn't think you'd come back. And I said, are you kidding? I said, I know you could have hurt me. I know you could have hurt me. You could have hurt me. I mean, you had me. That was it. I said, but you didn't. You just dominated me. You just, you know, you just showed me who was boss. And, uh, and I got to learn that. You know, I'm not going to be happy until I can do that. I mean, I'm not going to be happy until, until I, can, I can get back in this room with you and and basically, we can go toe to toe and and go at it, and I can hold my own. Because as long as I can't do that, that means that I'm a real little fish in a real big pond, and there's a whole lot of big fish out there. So uh, there's only one place to be, and that's where the competition is the stiffest, and that's where the instruction is the best. And uh, after that, I they uh, I really developed a family. I really developed a family with them, and those people are still my friends today, and uh, still highly respected. And yeah, that's it, you know. But you, but you have to start somewhere, and you have to, you have to dig in, and you have to be willing to uh, sweat. And you have to be willing to take some bruises, and you have to be willing to to get out there with people who uh, who are better than you. And you have to be lucky, lucky enough. Uh, that they'll be compassionate enough and, and lack, uh, not have, not have such an overblown ego that, uh, that they'll just go out there and crush you. And, uh, I never found that. I never, uh, I, see with Jim, I never, never experienced ego. I never had that problem. We were, he went really hard with me a lot of times, but, uh, I wouldn't have had it any other way. The matter of ego comes up on this show quite a bit. How do you, think martial artists can best keep their ego in check? I had a drunken uncle years ago, and uh, I'll just use the initials because I won't use the words he used, but he told me something that was very valuable when I was a kid. He said, never buy your own BS. And that's it. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't buy into your own hype. Uh, I'm 67 years old now. I've been, I've had schools in, in, you know, I've, I've managed schools in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Indianapolis, Indiana. I had a school on the Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles and Hollywood, uh, you know, which sounds really impressive. It was a tough school. I had some really good, tough students. We didn't make a whole lot of money. The economy was rough at that time. Uh, we had some really good competition. Uh, and through all those years and, and through all that, uh, I now hear things that I'm supposed to have done. And yeah, there's, there's probably a basis, you know, everything has a basis in fact somewhere. Um, 
but let me tell you, that stuff has grown. <laughs> you know, and it just, I, I've heard uh, stories about myself and other people, particularly other people who are more charismatic than me. I've always, uh, I guess I'm charismatic enough, but you know, but I, I don't make an effort to be uh, to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, and some people do, and that's that's how you develop that that huge name in any anything, whether it be entertainment or martial arts. And martial arts has a whole lot of entertainment and a whole lot of theater in it. Uh, you know, and if you're charismatic and that attention comes to you, then your name will grow. And uh, the thing that you can't do is is when people start telling you how great you are, you can't buy into that. Just remember where you came from. Mm. Remember where you came from. I think that's, that's a secret. At least that's been one that's helped me to remember. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, I, I go to seminars and videos recently at, uh, at a black belt, uh, testing weekend for lack of better terminology. And they did all the demonstrations and the people were very, very, very nice. I mean, these are the nicest people in the world. Uh, one of the best family organizations I've ever seen, but they're very, uh, you know, formal in that they, you know, they're all master childers and master childers this. And can we get you something? Can we do something for you? And I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the treatment. I appreciate the treatment. Everybody loves to have, to have their ego stroked a little bit, but the fact of the matter is, is I have a good friend in Scotland, Stuart Gavin, who is a, 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 an amazing martial artist over so there, a Kimpo Jiu-Jitsu guy. And he sums it all up. He said, my mother called me Stuart. That's what you can call me. And that's really what it boils down to is, you know, my mother called me Henry. Well, she didn't call me that, but <clears throat> she called me other things. But, uh, but that that's really the basis of it. You know, master's a, a wonderful title, but I'll never be a master. I'll be a good journeyman. Because a good journeyman always has a craft and studies their craft and works at it. And they'll share it with their apprentices, but they still have people they can look to and they still have things they can learn. So you start, uh, it, it's fine to be called a master and it's wonderful to reach that level and that rank and so forth. And a lot of it's about perception. Uh, but you better remember where your roots are and remember who you are and why you're here to begin with and why those people that you're working with are here. So, you know, it's about sharing, particularly when you get old, it's about sharing, you know, you've got a lot of experience under your belt, you know, share it. And when I leave, I hope the people I, I worked with, uh, can take it a step further than I ever could and can share it with a few more people than I could. Um, you know, cause that's, uh, that's really it. You know, I want to give I want to, I want them a good foundation and I want them to, to continue on in, into places where, where I, where I never made it. Cause you know, that next generation, every, everything should grow and everything should get better. You know, times change. Martial arts have to change with it. I agree. I like it. I, I think you just gave the best description on title that I've ever heard. And, and listeners, you might want to roll back the last five minutes and listen to that again if you didn't catch it. Because it kind of clubbed me upside the head and I loved it. What do you do when you're not involved with martial arts? What I do when I'm not involved in the martial arts, what I like to do. Yeah. You have any hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have any hobbies? Yeah, uh, I don't scuba dive as much as I used to because uh, uh, just because I don't have an opportunity as much as I used to have. Sure. But yeah, I, you know, I, I do a lot of walking. I like to leave it around. I like to cook. Uh, I like to garden with my wife. We have some gigantic koi in our uh, koi pond, and I get a real kick out of uh, you know watching Moby Dick come to the surface and eat and things like that. Uh, I enjoy. Uh, Spending time with uh, with 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 people that I have common interest with, uh, you know, I I, I have a, a nice little convertible I like to take out in the country. We used to take long long rides on the motorcycle. Uh, when I first met my wife thirty years ago or better, uh, we used to jump on a bike in uh, Los Angeles and take off and go up to Yosemite, or go up to the wine country, or you know go go down to Mexico, and that was all on two wheels. 
But uh, the last several years have been a little hard on her health-wise. Uh, she's had to deal with cancer. Mm-hmm. So the long, long bike rides are, are not as... Uh, she can't do them as like she used to. And then I can't do them as much as I used to either. You know, I got a great motorcycle. It's huge and it's beautiful and it's really nice. But uh, I can't stay in the saddle for a thousand miles at a time. Whereas that convertible, I can lay back and relax and uh, enjoy the air and take my wife with me. And if she gets tired, we put the top up. Sure. I know we have more than a few gearheads that listen to this show. So I've got to ask you, what kind of bike, what kind of convertible? Oh, uh, it's a uh, 2014 Stratoliner by Yamaha. It's 1900 cc fuel injected. It's a great big cruiser, mm. and uh, I picked it because it had the had everything I wanted. You know, it still had a nice sporty look to it, but also it had one of the best maintenance records in the industry for ten years running. And I I really hate to work on things. I'd much rather just throw my leg over it, take it for a ride, and. You know, I hate it when people look at me and they say, really, you're you're taking your motorcycle to Dallas? Well, who's following you? Well, why should anybody be following me? I'm not anticipating this, you know, it's breaking down, you know. So I, I, I'm i big on, on maintenance. I'm big on keeping things in good shape. If you ever get a machine from me, it'll, it'll still be in good shape. I sold one a couple of years ago that I had 98,000 miles on. The guy's got 125,000 on it now, and it's still going strong. So, uh that and the convertible, oh, the convertible's a 2008 Chrysler Sebring, navy blue with a black cloth top. Yeah. And kind of a grayish, dove gray leather interior. Real nice. It's nice. It's small. But uh, six-owner, got great pickup. Sure. You know? Sure. You don't, you, don't need, you don't need more than that. I mean, it's, it's, about, no. it's about the experience uh, on the open road rather than, you know, what color the dash is or what's on the, di- on the hood. Had it not been for uh, for Al Tracy opening Tracy Karate Studios in Louisville, Kentucky, I would not have met Jim, who uh, became a lifelong friend and a uh, you know great instructor. Mm. And Greg, uh, he was a great lawyer when he was a lawyer too. He's a very smart man. Uh, but I also probably wouldn't have moved to California. Would have never met my wife. Wouldn't have had a lot of the travel and the experiences and uh, would not have met so many of the wonderful people that I've had the opportunity to uh, work with and uh, learn from and share with and so forth. So um, I do owe Al a a great debt of Mm -hmm. gratitude. Al was not my my instructor. He was, I'm second generation. He was uh, Jim's instructor. So I'm second generation there and, and uh, make no claim to being first generation under Al. Uh, but I certainly have no complaints about being under, uh, you know, being with Jim. Sure, sure. He gave me a, a great family. He, he also came up, he came up under a guy named Bob Babich. And Bob was a, a small man, my understanding, but everything I heard about Bob Babich, he was an extremely tough guy, very fast fast to the point that people didn't believe he could be that fast. And uh, he came, was in Kang to Kwan, which is a Korean forum and much more of a, uh, you could read, kind of equated along the lines of Shodokan, you know, very power oriented. Whereas Kenpo, of course, is much more speed oriented and combination oriented. Uh, Kang to Kwan is a uh, kata based art, whereas Kenpo here again is a technique based art. So getting that foundation from Stuart in the, in power, and the use of power and being able to combine it with, uh, with all the things that came through the Tracy company, uh, and all the, the Kimpo things really gave me a leg up on a lot of things. Cause I was able to, to generate that power when I needed it. And I still had to, had the speed and the combinations. So sure. I got, I got to thank those guys for, uh, for that, I, I think cross training is invaluable as long as you train long enough to understand what you're actually doing, and don't just you know jump from one thing to another like a you know rubber ball. And so, yeah. That being said, well, you know, I hadn't planned. You know, we we kind of didn't enter back in gracefully. There was a bit of a jump if if we leave it the way it it, it lies. But the things that you just said, I think, are, are rather important to share. Are you okay with that? Sure. Okay. 
So then, listeners, because as you know, I don't like to jump in in the middle. So what happened was, um, you know, we'll, we'll chop that part out, but Master Childers took a call because we are recording on the day that Grandmaster Al Tracy, great Grandmaster Al Tracy, if I'm correct on his title, passed away. And so um, there are quite a few folks, some of whom have been on the show, who are, you know, in, in various degrees of, I guess, mourning. And so this call likely was about great Grandmaster Tracy and and that. Yeah. I just... Uh... Day before yesterday, I think it was, I just uh, spoke with Mark, and uh, he's down in Tampa. He just got done doing a tour around the country, and uh, we were talking about his dad, Al. So, uh, yeah, if it hadn't been for Al Tracy and him and, and, and the the Tracy Studios, and uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I moved to Los Angeles. I hadn't been training really actively in a bit, and... Uh, I had to make a living. I was, you know, I was a young guy, and I had to make a living. I had to figure out something to do. So, you know, I was uh, kind of kicking around. Didn't have a place to live. I was living underneath a house up in uh, West Hollywood that my brother had a rock band in, and he wouldn't let me live in the house because I might upset the rockabilly guys. That was this rough old character, and they were much more sensitive than I. Uh, <laughs> not, nice, nice people, but... but yeah. But yeah, there well, you go. Anyhow, so I'm sleeping underneath this house, and uh, I have very little money, and no prospects of getting a place of my own until I can get some get some money to kind of make make some money. So I went to the internationals down in Long Beach, Ed Parker's internationals, which I'd always always heard about, and, uh, and just you know I, I couldn't wait to get there because I was going to see all these great guys. I was going to see you know I had aspirations of you know meeting Chuck Norris of. Benny Aquides, Howard Jackson, Mike Stone, uh, you know, all these guys, Ed Parker, you know, all these guys, you know, that I'm thinking, oh, the internationals, they're all going to be there. And yes, they all were there. Uh, I mean, it's one of the greatest tournaments in the world, and I'm sure it still is, even though I'm in Texas now, I'm not in California any longer. But so I go down to the Long Beach Internationals, I get down there, take a bus, just have enough money to get in. And I'm wandering around trying to see what I can see. And lo and behold, there is my old instructor, Jim Stewart, who had come out there to go to law school at uh, UCLA, which I might add, he came out first in his class. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, I had a place to live. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I had a roommate. And I had a, a lot of good years of sharing a, a place with uh, James while he was uh, pursuing other things other than the martial arts. And while I got lucky and uh, went into a Tracy studio to work out and ended up uh, running the place. So, you know, I mean, you can't ask for a much better scenario than that. What do you want to do? You want to go out and dig ditches or you want to teach karate? I don't know about you, but I'll teach karate every time. Yeah. So, uh, much more fun. And, uh, and also to have my, my old instructor there, not at my school, but they're available for me to continue my training with him. Uh, you can't ask to be much luckier than that, you know? No, certainly not. So, uh, and yes, I did get to meet all those guys, except for Mike Stone. He's a friend on Facebook, but he seems to be a very nice guy. Uh, everybody else got the opportunity to meet at one time or another. Oh, really? Yeah. You know? Do you, do you have any favorites? Like, you, you know, some of, well, of course, Chuck Norris, everyone knows who Chuck Norris is, but if you, uh, I, who is your favorite Chuck to Norris watch? Is, is, oh, to watch? Yeah. Yeah. If, if you know, cause not all of them are, uh, are uh, actors or anything. So if we're going to put them on equal footing, it would be martial arts. Well, we're talking martial arts. We're not talking acting. Right. Uh, and I have a great Chuck Norris story. I'll tell you about acting. Sometime when we're not on the air. Okay. He he can he can tell you. Uh but uh he's he's a really nice guy. He kept one of my students working for many years. I had a student, Charlie Steen, S T E E N. Really tough guy, good stunt man, worked on a lot of Norris's stuff and uh, uh Norris was always 
the, the few times I got to talk with him and meet him, he's always a gentleman. But honestly, back when I was about a brown belt, because he's 10 years my senior, I used to dig up things on Chuck Norris because he had just the some of the best, cleanest technique. I mean, he had some of the best kicks. Uh, his spin kicks were just extraordinary. Uh, you, you know, he, he had this beautiful technique. So, yeah, he was one of my favorites. Now, one of my favorites that I was lucky enough to get to know and, and have the honor to, uh, to work with just a little bit was, uh, Howard Jackson, who, uh, was just a really nice man. Howard passed away a few years ago himself of, uh, cancer. And, uh, but he was, he was a, a, a great guy and he was like five times world lightweight full contact champion. Uh, just, and funny, what a funny guy. He had a sense of humor that wouldn't stop. So, uh, yeah. Those are a couple of the guys, I guess. Mm. You know? Such great names that you're mentioning. I mean, just, uh, you know, an well, era of martial arts that we'll never have. You're lucky to get to meet those people, you know? Yeah. So, uh, I'm old now, so I, somebody told me I was in the golden age of martial arts. I guess we're in platinum now. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. One of the things that I, I guess, I enjoy is the wrong word, but I appreciate asking all of our guests is about the difficult times that they go through. I find that martial artists have a, a different toolbox to handle life's rough stuff. And I'm wondering if you might tell us about a difficult time in your life and how you were able to handle it. Well, probably the best tool I've ever had is a heavy bag because I've never needed a psychiatrist. Between a heavy bag and a, and a motorcycle, I've always been able to pretty much cope with anything. So, uh Really? I don't know. I guess probably some of the most difficult times is when I was a kid, you know, and, and I had a abusive stepfather and, you know, and my mother was being abused and I was scared, you know, and uh, the way I coped with that was finding the martial arts and finding some foundation, finding out that there were people out there that were really tough people that uh, weren't impressive. If they were kind and they were caring and they shared, uh, you know, that's, I, I guess that's, you know, 15 years ago, my uh, wife was diagnosed with uh, cancer and she was given two months to live. My son was five years old. And the things, I guess, the things that, that I learned from the people in the martial arts, not from the arts themselves. The arts themselves are, are tools, they're mechanics, they're body mechanics. You know, it's, it's physics. Uh, but from the people was that, that you just don't give up. You don't quit. Uh, Karen Green, Roger Green's wife. I don't know if you met Roger, really nice man up in Oklahoma, tough guy. Karen, wonderful woman, smart. We were talking one time. She said, you know, the only difference in a black belt and a white belt, it's just a white belt that didn't give up, just didn't quit. And that's really it. Uh, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other one and you keep, keep going forward. In my wife's case, uh, we fired doctors immediately, got into other doctors and uh, some good medicine. Uh, a little help from Bub, and uh, she's just the toughest person I've ever entire life. Uh, she's still here with me today, and our son's 20 now. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's how you cope. You cope. You draw in, you know, you circle your way on the people you love, and you, you hope to be in. You, you draw strength from uh, and from all the things that you've, uh, you've done in the past. You either... you. <laughs> You know, it, it, there's a lot of really corny sayings, you know, but the fact of the matter is when you get knocked down, you got two trees, you either stay down or you get up. Hmm. And that's it. It's the only choices you have. You either you either continue putting one foot in front of the other and, and live in life, or you don't. And, uh... Yeah. That's, 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 that's when you find out how to, things like that happen. It's not, it's not just 
hard somebody hits you, you know, uh, it's not, it's not, not the guy out there who can throw a really good hard punch or a good hard sidekick. You know, yeah, they're 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 to be admired, but it's the people who get up every day and they do the things they have to do to take care of their family, and to continue on. And sometimes they're not real happy with what they have to do, but there are people that depend on them, and uh, and they're out there and they they do it and they're tough. You know, it's it's those everyday people that, that they teach you how to live. One of my favorite sayings is that people are like goldfish. They will grow to the size of the bowl that they're given. People tend to rise to the occasion. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I got asked a few years back at a seminar because I've, I've had the opportunity over the years to, you know, spar with people who are you know, really top fighters. Uh, you know, we had Joe Lewis come into our schools there when, we were in Kentucky and you can't get much tougher than Lewis nope. and much better fighter, you know, and, uh, I, I had the pleasure of being able to do all that, but you know, I had a guy ask me some, well, who's the absolute toughest person you've ever known? And I didn't even hesitate. It's my wife. She's been battling demons that you can't see. And she's been going on against insurmountable odds and she's still there, you know? So all those people who are doing that and do it every day. I have nothing but admiration for them. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, that's it. That. So you, it's probably getting a little bit off. I'm sorry. sorry no. There, you know. Not at all. No worries. You've mentioned a lot of great people, people that, you know, others have trained with and folks that people would love to train with. But if I had to ask you to choose one of them that was the most influential on your martial arts, who would that be? <laughs> oh, right back to Jim. Okay. He's what gave me my foundation. Uh, he gave me my foundation. Now, I've, I've gone and trained in other areas and other arts other than what, what we've worked on. And, uh, but he's still my friend. He's still still my mentor. I can I can still talk with him for fifteen minutes and and realize things that I should have realized thirty years ago. It's like teaching a student. Probably the most influential person to ever meet is somebody you train, because you know you're seeing it through this person's eyes, maybe for the first time. And if you share this knowledge, you share this experience with somebody, and you don't learn from it. Boy, are you wasting a, just an incredible opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, it, you, you work with somebody, you share something with somebody, and all of a sudden you realize that you see see them do it. You see that light come on, and you realize that you know maybe there's there's a little bit more of this than, than I, I thought. I had this this sucker nailed. You know, I thought I had this one figured out, but all of a sudden you see it through somebody else's eyes. So probably your best your best teachers in the entire world is who you're teaching. I have a feeling anybody out there that has spent a lot of time instructing is nodding their head. I know I am. Absolutely. I learned more in the two years that I had my own martial arts school than in any other probably 10 year period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, having, having, uh, You know, I did bodyguard work. I did loss prevention work. I did bounty work. I did serve papers. I did some, some bad areas. That gives you, you know, some really good practical experience to figure out what works and what doesn't work. But it doesn't turn those lights on like, like, like when when you work with somebody and you share something with somebody, you 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 take this great responsibility on because you know here again you're not teaching them how to make a peanut butter sandwich. You're teaching them how to defend themselves. Maybe it's been someone they, they love. And that's, that's a huge responsibility. And one of the big responsibilities of the student is, is not just take things at, at on blind faith. Just because I come out here and say this is the way this is done, this, just because I say this is so, does not necessarily make it so. You should question it. You should deconstruct it. You should take it apart. You should find out what makes it work for you. 
And that, and the only way you can do that, you know, because we're all going to, hopefully all, all, all of them are, all these people are going to, you know, the young ones are going to grow up, they're going to have their own children, they're going to maybe have their own students. But certainly sometime in their life, they're going to teach your kid how to put his hands up and protect himself or her hands up and protect herself. And the only, only way you can do that is by really understanding what makes it work. If you can do that, if you can break it down and you can understand it physically, then then you can at least pass that physical part along. Now, spiritually, hopefully through your training, you'll find out that, you know, like I found out over the years, that some of the toughest guys I know, the toughest people I know, or the nicest people I know, have the best values. They're not thugs. They're, they're good, upstanding people who really care about... Uh, their families, their country, you know, this, that, and the other, uh, you know, and they're willing to share with you, you know. It's tough to learn from somebody who's who's just out there to, to fight because they're going to come out there and bang you around and get what they can get out of it, then they're going to be on their merry way. So to find a good trainer who's willing to share with you, is uh, that's a real blessing. If and you... not hold anything back. Mm. What do you mean? Well, I've known people over the years. I had a student came to me several years ago when I first came to Texas. I had a small school down here. Shared it with a guy named Mike Law. Mike's a really wonderful judo practitioner, player. Uh, nice guy. Uh, but I had a student come in, and he wanted to learn how to better use his hands because that boxed as well as, you know, doing tempo and so forth. And he kept quizzing me and quizzing me and quizzing me about it. What would you do if? What would you do if? Because I'm twice as old as him, and you know, and, and I'd say, well, this is this is how I would handle it. It was all in sport and you know, competitive uh, martial arts. And I knew what he was doing. He was he was teaching for another school. And I knew he was teaching for him. I don't care if he's teaching for somebody else. It's, you know, it's no skin off my nose. I and mean, he's got a job and he's enjoying being an instructor. And it's a, it's a lot of fun instructing people. And, you know, it's a, it's a great honor. It's a privilege. Uh, but so he's trying to figure out how to beat somebody in particular. This is obvious. And this eventually came to pass. He came in one day and he said, aha, you know, I, I bested this guy, but I was polite and I was respectful and all this. But they turned around and asked me where I learned this. And he said, I told them. And they told me that I could either quit studying with you or stop teaching for them. He said, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, that's up to you. And I said, you know, it's your decision. And I said, if you want to continue coming here, he said, well, what about I'm teaching something that you taught me at somebody else's place? And I said, that's okay. You know, you're still sure to know it. You know, you're spreading the word as it were, you know, and, uh, I trust you. You're a good, you're a good, good person, you know. So anyhow, he disappeared for about three or four weeks. And I thought, well, you know, he's decided to continue teaching there. And, uh, you know, and I don't blame him, you know. Good gig. Nice respect and all that. And uh, he came in after three or four weeks with his gym bag. And he said, can I come back? And I said, well, of course you can. You never left. And he said, but he said, I, I did leave. And, uh. Uh, I didn't talk to you about it until I was disrespectful. I said, no, I understand what was going on. He said, I'm back now, he said, because they told me that I could not do this and still continue working with them. He said, that's an ultimatum. You turned around and told me, yeah, go. Do do what you're going to do. You know, it's, it's, it's human nature. Expand your knowledge. You know, if you want to do this, you're going to do it. And it, it, it doesn't take away from what we share. And uh, he said, so I told him I had to go, that if it was an ultimatum that I was going to go where, you know, I learned the most. And he said, frankly, in six months, he said, I picked up more here than I did in six years. So that was a great compliment to me. I really felt good about that. But the thing is, you can't give people ultimatums. You can't can't put them in a box. Uh, I've studied Kimbo for a lot of years. And, you know, there's just hundreds of self-defense techniques in Kimpo. And Kimpo's not only karate, it's Kimpo jiu-jitsu as well. <laughs> it works real hard to put that jiu-jitsu aspect back in those self-defense techniques and make it work. 
And one of the things that helped me was I had the opportunity to work with Wally J in Small Circle Jiu-Jitsu. And just in the few times I was able to work with uh, with him, uh, his principles uh, helped me so much and opened up new fields of thought. Uh, you know, I got to work with Remy Prices and our niece. And it's very flowing art, you know, edged weapons, a lot of grappling in there, a lot of locks in there. And that helped my tempo. That helped what I do. That helped my, my primary art that I love. So... So there's nothing wrong with doing this that way. If you could train with any martial artist that you haven't, living or dead, anywhere in time, who would that be? Oh, wow. Uh, if I could train with any martial artist, living or dead, that I haven't. Hmm, boy, that is just a gigantic field. Uh, there's several, actually. Uh one of my, I'd love to train with still today, who's still living, uh, but getting up here in the years is Gene LaBelle. Mm. I'd like to go back to my, my judo roots, and uh, I think I think Gene and I would get along really well <laughs> if, he, if he didn't break me in half. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, he's got a pretty tough reputation. Uh, and then Masoyama. I mean, I'd, I'd love to go back there and uh, and, uh, and, and get some of that uh, just amazing power that he had. Uh, probably that's a, that's a couple of good ones right there, you know. Uh, that, 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 that gives you both ends of the spectrum. You can either hit them or you can choke them out. <laughs> Dean Bell does choke people out, doesn't he? I, I, I don't know if he does that specifically. That. I, I've heard some stories, and my memory of them isn't so much the specifics, but just, as you mentioned, his I, reputation I for being such a tough guy. Maybe a couple of celebrities that we could ask, uh, but I, I won't go into that. Uh, Gene Bell and I have one thing in common, though. We do have one thing in common. and uh, Well, two things. We're both exceptionally handsome. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And uh, I'll pay for that someday. Uh, we both wrestled a bear. So uh, um, I'm not. I can't let you gloss over that one. You wrestled oh, a bear. Bear. Yeah, I wrestled a bear. I, I couldn't pass up the, the opportunity. The bear won. Uh, he didn't. He didn't have any trouble with me whatsoever. <laughs> what's What's the context for this? Where did you wrestle a bear? Uh, in the, at the Kentucky State Fair, uh, several years back, uh, I was there and there was a, a bear there, Bud the Wrestling Bear. His name was actually Lewis. And, uh, and, uh, I have a, a lovely daughter from many years ago and I was there with her and she was still fairly you know, young. She had a boyfriend who was, a, a big wrestler. So, uh. I was running my school out in Los Angeles at the time, and he was kind of giving me a lot of grief. And I was, I was, I'd been told I had to be on my best behavior, so I couldn't just do anything because I found him to be a, a bit boorish, shall we say, uh, a bit full of himself. At any rate, uh, so I, I took him all to the state fair, and we were passing the circus tent. And there was by the wrestling bear, so I said, "Let's go wrestle the bear." And it was really my way of uh, putting him in his place because I knew good and well he wouldn't wrestle the bear, but Daddy had to wrestle the bear once he had, had you know, thrown out the gauntlet. And uh, I, the night before, I had gone with a friend of mine who's uh, chief of police in a town right outside of Louisville, Kentucky, another great martial artist, a really uh, guy I trained with years ago, Joe Grinzi, uh, who was middleweight and really tough guy, uh, was in police work for many years. But anyhow, we'd gone to the wrestling matches the night before, and I'd seen the WWF at that time, now WWE, <laughs> and watched Hulk Hogan wrestle uh, Paul Orndorff with the evil Bobby the Brain Heenan in the corner. And we had laughed till we cried, you know, and had a, had a, had a good time. And uh, so, so I wrestled the bear, and they, they line up five people, and you each get three minutes or until the bear pins you. So I put myself right in the middle of the five because I wanted to see two people wrestle the bear, but I didn't want the bear to be in a bad mood after having wrestled too many, you know. 
you know, I didn't want him to be thinking, well, this is the fifth one. Get him out of here. Uh, so I put myself in the middle and I was hooting and hollering and, and being a, being a complete idiot and showing off for my daughter and, and working the crowd. You know, I, I watched, watched the big time guys the night before. So I was having more fun with it than I could stand. So they bring the bear out, they put the bear in the ring and, the man explains that you don't hit the bear, not that you're going to hurt this 637-pound bear, but if you hit the bear, the bear hits you back, so that's probably not a good thing to do. You don't do anything abusive. You don't try to gouge the bear in the eyes or anything because the bear is going to get angry, and he is much larger than you. So, you know, use some common sense wrestling. It's up and up on the Marcus of Queensberry wrestling rules, I suppose. So I'm just having a fine time thinking I'm in the middle, and he leans over at the ring, and he says, you're first. And I went, me? Why me? He said, because you're having way too much fun. Uh, so he got me up in the ring, and he explained that the bear knew 32 amateur wrestling holes, and the bear had a muzzle and had no claws. And uh, so the bear and I squared off, and... The bear hooked my ankles, stuck his nose in my uh, nether regions, took me down, and all I saw was a giant bear head coming up toward me, you know, cr crawling right up the middle of my body. So I stuck my arms out to try to block him, and he took my arm in his mouth and kind of chewed on it like he was like a dog playing, you know. The muzzle wasn't very effective, in other words. And then he spun around and laid across me, so my feet were sticking out one side, my head was sticking out the other side, and I had this big smelly bear laying on top of me. And there's no way I'm going to move a 600-pound bear. So I'm flopping my little feet up and down, and this wrestling guy looks at me. He says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing a kickout. They did it last night, and it worked for Hulk Hogan. And he said, he wasn't wrestling a bear. <laughs> so, uh, so they got me up, and they let me. Actually, you're only supposed to be able to wrestle him once. But I was having so much fun, and the crowd was too, that they let me wrestle two more falls. Unfortunately, he beat me all three falls. Just with no problem at all, but I had more fun than I could stand and smelled like a barnyard when I was done. And uh, I'd do it again. I'd, I'd do that again. Uh, even now, I think I'd do that again. It was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, I didn't figure they put a bear out there that was going to eat me. You know, so hopefully, right. So that that's how I wrestled the bear, and it's yeah. why I wrestled the bear. And I didn't hear much more about uh, the ineffectiveness of karate and how. What a great wrestler this kid was after that. <laughs> and I kept I just looking at him and go, Bear, you wouldn't wrestle the bear. <laughs> what, yeah, a, I was what a wonderful what story. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, didn't have to hit him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I wrestled the bear. It was worth it. Would you have not wrestled yeah. the bear otherwise? I, you know, I probably would have sat there and, and just watched it, you know, and, and said, oh, how cool that, 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 that little mischievous streak in you, you know, that, that said, oh, this, this was an opportunity to, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I would have probably just watched, but I had, I had a little, uh, you know, I had, had a little one-upsmanship going on, you know, sure. so I had, had to take that opportunity. You got to look good in the eyes of your daughter. Of course, they made us keep all the windows down in the car going home because that did smell like a bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what can you say? I actually have some pictures of that around here. They're not very good, but I've got a couple. If, if you could get a couple of those to us for the show notes, that would be fantastic. And for folks that are listening, <laughs> uh, we keep the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com if you might be new to we wouldn't have heard that before, but that's that's where we do we put photos and links and stuff like that over there. I've run across them. It's it's just a giant bear laying on top of me. It's, it's <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I'd do it again. As a matter of fact, I, I'd probably do it quicker now than I, I would have been because I kind of know what to expect. Sure. And the bear would probably eat me now, so, you know, what can I say? I'm, I'm much thinner. So, yeah. As we've talked, it's become uh, abundantly clear that you still love martial arts, you're still passionate about martial arts, and you're still active in martial arts. Oh, sure. And yeah. when I talk to folks on the show, and they they maintain that passion, it's usually because there's something that they're either working 
towards, you know, some kind of specific goal or just something, I don't want to necessarily say unfinished, but there's a reason, there's something motivating them. So I'm curious, what is your motivation for continuing to train? Hmm. You know, I, I hadn't, honestly, I hadn't thought about it. Uh, I suppose I'd like to leave something behind. I suppose I'd like to, uh, like everybody else, I'd like to, you know, get my two cents in there and uh, have some people look back and say, you know, uh, you know, it was uh, it was a joy. You know, I've had so much fun being the student and working with people over the years and learning from other people that, uh, you know, and I, and I look back at these guys as, as father figures and friends and things, and it was, it's a huge part of my life. With, without, without the martial arts... You know, like I said, when I was a kid, I didn't have much of a family, and that's that's where I found my family. Uh, you know, these these are the people that have. Uh, that's it's one of the things. I've been in a lot of really great schools over the years. I've I've, I've visited people, done seminars, done this, done that. Uh, you know, and I've seen some really really tough schools. And some schools you go in and you take good lessons and you learn good good martial arts, and then you go home and you practice. Other schools develop a community. They develop uh, a family within the school itself, and that's that's just an extraordinary thing. And I've I've been so lucky to uh, to been associated with a couple of schools that have done that. I'm currently uh, I, I'm really enjoying some of the people I, that I've had the opportunity to meet in the last couple of years, and. Uh, they they really uh, taken me in, made me part of their family, and I think that's that's a huge part of it. You know, family's uh, family's the, the biggest thing in my life, and and not only my immediate family, uh, but that's that's where, that's my extended family. So yeah, I want to I want to I want to keep hanging out with these people because because they they've got so much to give, and and uh, and I'm, I'm just uh, so lucky to be able to to be able to do it. To, to be still be able to do it, you know, still be able to still keep kicking, as they say. Uh, I think that the, some of the most important things is not, not not necessarily how tough you get, but how it changes your life. I had a, a student years ago that I hadn't thought anything about. I, I, he came into school, he stuttered, and he shook, and he was real, he had no self-confidence, and I worked with him for about three years. And he was a really nice young man. And he came in after three years and he said, I got to talk to you. I'm leaving. And I said, did I do something wrong? And he said, no, no. He said, I just want to tell you that I'm moving to another state. I'm taking over a business. I'm engaged to be married. I'm leaving my, my family's home for the first time in my life. And he said, three years ago when I came in here, he said, I stuttered. I couldn't look you in the eye. He said, uh, he said, I know that I'm, I'm not the toughest guy that's ever walked through the door by any means. He said, but the thing is, he said, I'm going to go out on my own. I'm taking over a business. I'm engaged to be married. He said, I couldn't have done any of this three years ago. He said, working with you and working with the other people here, because we had, you know, that was one of the studios that uh, Jim, Jim owned. Uh, he said, and working with everybody else. And he said, he said, I realize there are people out there that will help me. And don't have any ulterior motive for helping me. They just do it for the joy of, of doing it. And he said, I realized that if I focused on something, I can actually accomplish it. I have self-worth. He said, I can do these things now. And you know what? That's probably the best student I ever had, or student experience I ever had. Because he wasn't a top rated fighter. He wasn't a great tournament fighter. He didn't go on and do any you know, full contact or anything. But he went on and his life was changed because of his experience there at that school. And that's really when you look at the martial arts now that's really for me at this point I just want to be able to share some of that. I just just want to be able to share that because it did it did that it did it for me. Like I said, had I not had my association uh, with Jim and with the Tracy Company and the Al and all that, I would have never met my wife. I would have never traveled halfway around the world. I wouldn't know people. 
that I know. I wouldn't have had these these experiences. I wouldn't have had the nerve to go. When I lived in Los Angeles, and I did some stunt work out there and worked with some stunt men and had a lot of fun. Didn't pursue it seriously as a career. Just got an opportunity to have you know to be on the fringes and have fun and and enjoy it. But would I have the nerve to to try any of this stuff that might have been a little off the cuff, a little crazy? Yeah, and maybe not. And you know, and it, 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 that's why you keep doing it because life's about the journey. It's not about the destination. Nobody gets out of life alive, so you better enjoy the trip. It seems that Master Childers turned out quite well, despite his not-so-pleasant childhood. And I think we can credit martial arts for keeping him on track. His stories were wonderful, and at times left me speechless. You know, sometimes in my role with this show, it's really hard to keep asking questions when all I want to do is listen. And this was one of those episodes. I want to thank you, Master Childers, for coming on the show. If you want to check out the show notes with links, everything that we talked about today, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. We put out some good stuff. You can find me at jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's really the best way, the email address. You can find all of our social media at whistlekick. And don't forget, you can find our products at whistlekick.com. There's a lot of ads in those few sentences, isn't there? <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate your time. Hope you're having a great day. Great week great month, whatever it is. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>